You'll notice in your schedule that um, Frank Fournier was supposed to be saying nothing is impossible. And I wish he were here to give us that message. I need it myself, especially being as how I'm here instead of him. I know that's a real letdown for you, but of course, you know, we require the students to be here so they have no choice. And uh, the rest of you, I feel sorry for you, but anyway, we'll try. <laughs> But, uh, you know, the fact is nothing is impossible to us, to those who believe. Isn't that true? Yeah. I'm glad to know that. And I'm glad that there's a promise in the Bible that says that. Because we know that everything is really impossible to us in a way, all on our own. But with God, all things are possible. And, of course, that's something that we have talked about earlier in the week. I'd like to talk to you about, oh, I don't know, a little potpourri of things this evening. And we'll see where the Spirit leads. I know that uh, I heard a, a, a preacher say some years ago that when he first started, he started as a very young man. The Lord called him to preach, but he had no idea how to do anything, how to preach and how to go about things. And so he, um, he, he was asked by a, a pastor to go and to preach a Wednesday evening prayer meeting service at his church. He said, I'm going to be out of town. I would like to have you come by and, and do that. And I've heard that the Lord's called you to preach. And, and he said, yes, I believe the Lord has called me to preach. And so he said, well, come to my church and you can do the, the sermon, the service for the Wednesday evening prayer service. And so he had no idea that he was supposed to study and, and put together an outline. He'd heard people say that, uh, you know, the Lord laid such and such on my heart, and so he thought that's how it went, that you just prayed and that the Lord would lead, lead you to say something, you know. So he went there, and head elder stood up, and he said, uh, you know, Brother So-and-so is here with us this evening, and we're all looking forward to know what it is the Lord has laid on his heart. And he said, well, you know, he was kind of looking forward to know what the Lord laid on his heart, too, because so far he hadn't laid anything. And so he didn't quite know what to say, and so he said a few things and stumbled around and this and that, and finally he, he said, you know, I, I can't do this, and he sat down in humiliation. <laughs> and uh, years later, after uh, he'd had, you know, a, a, a good uh, career as a pastor, he said that one of, he, he preached at a camp meeting, and somebody came up to him after the service and said, you know, you've done quite a little bit. A little bit since that first night, he says, I was at that prayer meeting that you <laughs> had where you didn't, where you couldn't preach the sermon, you know, and so uh, he said, you only lasted for about five minutes, and tonight you lasted for over an hour. He says, I kind of like the other one better. <laughs> well, at any rate, so let's see what the Lord laid on our hearts this evening, and maybe we can move forward with this. What we need is the Holy Spirit here tonight. Isn't that true? So why don't we pray? Father in heaven, we need you. We, we cannot do anything on our own. And we've proven that so many times. But with you, all things are possible. And so we, we pray that you would be here, that you would especially bless us through the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Each mind, each heart today needs you. We need you. And so we pray that you would be here present in this room this evening. And that this little talk that I give would be just the thing that your spirit can use to talk to the hearts of those who are here. Bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you wouldn't mind turning in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. And uh, if you look at Mark chapter 9, you know that it starts off by Jesus calling some of his disciples. Um, Peter, James, and John, to go with him to the top of a mountain, and there he was transfigured before them. You remember that story. And, and you remember that the, the, this little, I guess you could say, foretaste of heaven was given to the disciples right there, this, those three disciples. And, um, and you remember the, you know, the con kind of confusion that they, they had when they saw that glory of, of God that was, that was manifest there, and then they saw two men who were there walking with and encouraging Jesus and heard the voice of God. And it was an overwhelming thing for them. And they, they were just in awe of the whole thing. But you remember that there were some disciples that were left behind down at the bottom of the hill. And do you remember what happened to them? 
Well, you remember that there was a man who came along and um, approached the, the disciples and said, my son has a serious problem. Do you remember this? He has a serious problem and, you know, he, he, uh, he has fits. He gets thrown into the fire and so forth. The devil is, you know, takes a hold of him and, and makes him do things. And can you help? And they said they thought they could. And so you remember they tried to cast out the demon. Were they successful? No, they weren't. And so here comes Jesus with Peter, James, and John off of the mountain, and they've had this phenomenal experience, and they've, you know, they've been, um, uh, been, been just kind of dazzled with the glory of God, and, uh, and they're coming down, you know, with this awe of the afterglow of God's presence, right straight into the presence of this demon <laughs> who has tormented this poor child and his father who is just distraught and doesn't know what to do. And so he comes to Jesus and he says, um, I, I came here to get help from your disciples. And, and they tried, but they couldn't help. And if you can do anything, please help my son. And remember what Jesus said, what do you mean if I can do anything? The not, question is not whether I can do anything. The question is, can you believe anything? And what was the response of the poor father? He says, well, I believe, but I, please help. He realized his faith didn't measure up. Well, you remember the story went that Jesus was able to heal that young man, cast out that demon, and he was perfectly whole afterwards. And you say, praise the Lord. But you remember that the disciples afterwards, when they found Jesus in kind of a quiet place, they asked him, why is it that we couldn't do it? Why is it that we couldn't do it? What was, the, what was the problem? And in verse 29, Jesus opens their understanding. He says, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. He says, This kind of demon requires a special kind of experience. So this kind of demon requires this kind of commitment, this kind of person. And so he's saying that that kind, this kind of person needs to be prepared for the devil by what? Prayer and fasting. Right? It's not going to just come naturally. You are not prepared all by yourself. We are going to have to pay the price in order to be able to have this kind of experience. Now, realizing that all of us are expecting to have a special work to do in God's kingdom here on this earth even, right now, aren't we? Yeah. We're expecting that God will give us something to do. And indeed He has, hasn't He? Has He given you a work to do? Well, you need to be this kind of person with this kind of experience, don't you? You need to be the kind of individual who's willing to go about this with prayer and fasting. But how little of either of those we really do. And I know that in today's world, uh, you know, there's different kinds of fasting that's referred to. You know, so people will talk about having one kind of fast, another kind of fast. But, you know, the old-fashioned fast was what? Well, you would just commit your mind to one thing and forget about the uh, food part of it for now until we pray through. You know, the, the, the old timers used to call it praying through. I don't know whether we even use that term anymore. Does anybody know what I mean when I say praying through? Where you just prayed until the Lord gave you some kind of an answer, and that may take a while. Well, it's not because the Lord doesn't want to answer, is it? It's because we're not ready to hear what He has to say. And we may be thinking about this and that and the other thing and being distracted. And so he says, if you will single-mindedly seek after me, you will find me if you search for me with all your heart. So this kind of experience and this kind of person is necessary for this kind of work that God is asking us to do. And if we want to do that kind of work and we believe that he has called us, then we need to be willing to do as he has asked us to do. And we need to be willing to give all to Him. And that's really the price that has to be paid, isn't it? 
Because as long as we're holding something back, and as long as we're saying, well, I've given you 99%, or 98%, or almost all, we haven't given it all. We haven't really paid the price that we need to for that kind of experience. And so, for us today, the experience that we need is this kind of experience. The kind that God can depend on to be His people even in the face of persecution by demons. By the total lack of support from any earthly source. Now, you're probably thinking in your mind, am I ready for that kind of experience? And the answer is probably no. And the Lord gives you strength when you need it, doesn't He? Yes. But the fact is, in order for us to be ready, we have to be ready. And the kind of preparation that's necessary for the time of trouble that is just before us is not necessarily going to be canning a whole bunch of food. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, something's wrong with canning food. Don't get me wrong. I, I like canning food as much as the rest of, you know, everybody else. In fact, I like to eat. I don't know if you noticed that, but, you know, I like to have food to eat and so forth. That's not a problem. But that's not really the preparation that's necessary when we're talking about the time of trouble, is it? Uh, and, and also, um, it's good for us to know how to, uh, to work and to accomplish things, and maybe even to, to, uh, have a, uh, you know, to have the skill that's required to be able to grow an orchard and grow food. And Nothing wrong with any of those things. But there will come a time when every earthly support is cut off. Now, if it says every earthly support, that means every earthly support, doesn't it? Well, that includes the support that comes from the ground, too, doesn't it? So you may not have available to you your garden. You may have a skill, but you may not have it available to you. And so there will come, there will come a time, we know it's coming, where every earthly support is cut off. If you're going to be this kind of individual, then you're going to have to put in this kind of time. The preparation that's necessary is time. You remember Jesus told a story about ten virgins that uh, were supposed to be getting ready for a wedding ceremony. Now, I'm going to cut to the chase. You know the story, don't you? What were, what, what, who were the, these ten individuals? Who are they? Well, that's us, isn't it? Those who are waiting for, and what was the wedding that they were waiting for? They're waiting for the coming of the bridegroom, which is Jesus' second coming, right? Isn't that what we're waiting for? And in the meantime, they had the opportunity to either have enough oil or not have enough oil. And the coin of the realm, you remember that they were told, well, I, we don't have enough oil for you and ourselves, so go and buy from those that sell, and you know, you'll have your own. The coin of the realm is time. Because there came, there came a point where they didn't have any more time. They were out. It was done. And so the preparation, this kind of preparation that was necessary was for this time. And we don't have any time to lose, do we? Because there, we will come to the point where we realize, I can't get the oil I need. So for us to be this kind of person, we need to recognize our need today while there's still time. And then we need to be willing to set aside other things that less, are lesser importance and focus on the thing that is the most important, and that is to be this kind of person, the kind of person that God can depend on when everything is against us. Are you going to be God's person? Are you going to be this kind of person? That's the question, isn't it? Do you want to be this kind of person? You can say amen. amen. <laughs> Do you want to be prepared when Jesus comes? Yes. yes. That's, our, that's our hope. That is our aim. In fact, that's the reason that we're here. That's the reason that we're working. That's the reason for our organization. That's the reason for our church. That's the reason for the people who are in the church. That's the reason for the pastors. That's the reason for the evangelists. 
is all for that purpose, and that is to be prepared and to prepare others, help others to be prepared for Jesus' second coming. We need to be this kind of people, and we need to be ready, and we need to be able to, to know that we are ready also. So if we're going to do that, we're probably going to be an unusual kind of individual. In fact, God calls us peculiar. Are you aware of that? Deuteronomy 14, 2 says, For thou, who, who is Moses speaking to? He says, thou are you. We don't use the term thou anymore. But when he says, you are, who is he speaking to? Is he speaking to the Egyptians? No. Is he speaking to the Amorites, and the Malachites, and the Hivites, and the otherites that happen to be hanging around? No, he's talking to the Israelites, isn't he? Those people of God. So he's talking to, to God's people, and he's saying, For thou, or you, are a holy people unto the Lord your God, and the Lord hath chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all the nations that are upon the earth. So you are to be a peculiar people. That was in the Old Testament, but there's some in the New Testament that say the same thing. You're aware of that, right? Titus 2.14 the last part of the verse says, Who gave himself for us, is talking about Jesus, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. He uses the same phraseology as the Old Testament. Purify unto himself a peculiar people. And do you know what the last little bit of it is? Zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. Unusual people. This kind of people are going to be Peculiar. This kind of people are going to be zealous. This kind of people are chosen. This kind of people will keep all of the commandments. That's what it says. 1 Peter 2, 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. A peculiar people that you would what? Does anybody know what the rest of it is? That you would show forth the... Come on, Bible scholars, don't, don't lose me now. <laughs> that you would show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of... Come on, I'm pulling this out of you. Out of darkness into His marvelous light. We are this kind of people. The people that God has pulled, snatched away from evil and given us the opportunity to have marvelous light. Now, let me ask you this. Has He given everybody that opportunity? Yes. He's given everybody the opportunity. But you're the ones who have responded. You're the ones that He's called. You are the peculiar ones. And you realize that you'll be peculiar. And, and that's the way it is. Um... Probably, some would look at you and say, they're strange. If you're this kind of individual, it's kind of an unusual individual. But what exactly does the Lord mean when He says a peculiar people? What's He talking about? Well, it is true that while, you know, many people would see us as being strange or unusual, the definitions that it's talking about are those who are unique, distinctive. Those who, interestingly enough, belong exclusively to someone. And when God says, you are my peculiar people, He's saying, you belong exclusively to me. Well, you say, well, that's, that's pretty cool. But, having said that, you could say, I'm not sure I want to just be, you know, like, property. But that's not exactly the meaning of the word. It's not like, I own you like, uh, you know, a dog or you know, something like that. That's not what it's talking about. If you look at the meaning, especially in Deuteronomy, this Hebrew word that, that means peculiar, it means to lock up or to shut away in some way, to carefully lock it up like a jewel. Isn't that amazing? That we are this kind of individual, 
Therefore, God sees us as being incredibly beautiful and valuable, enough that He surrounds us with special grace to protect us from those things that would destroy. A guarded, special gem, so valuable that it needs to be guarded and, and specially encased. And you remember that story that Jesus told about the, the merchant man who went looking for a special particular jewel and he found a pearl. And this particular pearl was so costly that it was termed the pearl of great price. And the price was so great, how much did he have to give in order to obtain the pearl? Well, that's this kind of individual, isn't it? When God wants this kind of individual, He's talking about the kind of individual who gives everything that He has in order to be able to obtain the, the, the gem that God is offering, which is God-likeness. Sold everything that He had. It was that valuable. So are we starting to understand our value to God? That it's not that we're just going to be weird people. I mean... Weirdness is not really what God is calling us to. It is a special place in His kingdom. A, an exalted place that He sees for us. Something exalted. And then the Greek of these phrases, the meaning of the one in Titus, is similar to the, one, to the Hebrew meaning, but it is one's own or belonging, but the connotation is, is really broader. It is, it is like beyond and through and thorough and around. So again, we have this concept of being surrounded by God. Amen. Not just simply being owned by God. Well, you know, you, He owns everything, doesn't He? Yeah. He owns, you know, the world and the universe and everything's His. And so in that sense, we're His, but He's saying, I, I, yes, you're mine, but so much so that I want to surround you and keep you. And that's, that's an interesting word also in the Greek, the beyond and through and around. God claims us as His property, not like a workhorse, but He claims us as someone that He wants to completely surround with Himself, with His love. He loves us. What an incredible thought. Do you want to be this kind of individual? I know I do. But then the um, phrase in 1 Peter is actually a different phrase. And I'm not claiming to be a, a Greek scholar by any means, but, uh, um, but you know, we all have the, the capacity of having the lexicons and the dictionaries and all those kinds of things that can, can shed light on these words. And so the word that is in 1 Peter is again talking about property, but it has this connotation of going beyond like you are the most important thing to him, the most incredibly important property that he owns. You're, you're not just something that, you know, he has like some asteroid in space which belongs to him, but you are incredibly important. Enough so that he gave everything for you. The question is, Will we be the kind of individual who gives everything for Him? Will we be this kind of individual? Is that what we will be? Because God needs this kind of individual. In fact, the phrase in 1 Peter goes even so far as to use the, the, the term of one mind. Just like when someone is married, they're supposed to be one. Isn't that correct? Amen. When you are God's, you are one. One with Him. You think like Him. You act like Him. 
You want to talk like him? You want to save other souls like he does? You want to be this kind of individual? That's what we're looking for. That's what we want to be. That's the preparation that's necessary. And in order for us to have that, we need to give all just like he gave all to us. That's what he's looking for. And you know, it doesn't take a lot of individuals to, complete, to start a complete revolution in this area. There's a Spirit of Prophecy quote from Christian Service 121 that says this, When churches are revived, it is because some individuals seek earnestly for the blessing of God. So revival in the church comes about, why? Because somebody is looking for it. And, and, and uh, not just looking like, uh, hey, uh, hey, not that kind of looking, but the word earnestly is used. What does that mean? What does it mean when I'm earnestly wanting to do something? Sincere. What else? Well, it means that you want to put your whole heart into it, right? Uh, implies that it's important so therefore, we are not going to just search casually, but because it's important, we are going to search earnestly. We're putting everything we have into this. And when we do that, we bring about what again in the church? Revival. Revival. Just one individual can bring about revival in the church if they're earnestly seeking for it. Amazing. He hungers and thirsts after God and asks in faith and receives accordingly. So, this individual who is earnestly wanting revival and he prays, when he prays, he believes, he trusts, he depends that the Lord will give what he has promised. Are you this kind of individual? He goes to work in earnest. So, not only is he earnestly looking, that's wonderful, but he's also earnestly what? Working. <laughs> so he goes to work in earnest, feeling his great dependence upon the Lord, and souls are aroused to seek for a like blessing. And a season of refreshing falls on the hearts of men. One person starts a revival. Isn't that amazing? One person starts a revival. The extensive work will not be neglected. The larger plans will be laid at the right time. But personal, individual effort and interest for your friends and neighbors will accomplish much more than can be estimated. It is for the want of this kind of labor that souls for whom Christ died are perishing. What kind of labor? Well, it says earnest, but there's a preparation that's necessary before the earnest labor. What is it? Well, you need to be looking for God's blessing and praying in faith that He will give that and expecting it and you will receive it. And then you'll be prepared also to go and work. You'll be constrained. In fact, you'll be kind of pushed forward to do God's work. Anybody have that experience? Have you had that experience? I hope you have. But if you haven't, what's the cure? Well, you need to earnestly seek. And the way that we get this earnestness is by beholding, isn't it? The time that we spend, the coin of the realm, becomes the, the, the purchase, way that we purchase, if you want to call it that, without money and without price, God's blessing, God's spirit, God's, uh, His energy to move us forward. And that energy catches on, and other people then see the energy. And haven't you seen that happen? People see something is happening, and then they want to go there. Say, so, may not even really know what it is, may not even like it, but well, let's go down and see what's happening. And that can be your experience. And that's what God is looking for. He's looking for this kind of individual. I remember a, a um, an evangelist told a story about. A church that he had gone to, and I, I feel sorry for you if you've been here for very long because you've heard my stories and so you know the stories, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Um, evangelist had, had been asked to have a week of prayer, and, and he went to a church was he, when he was considerably younger than when he told the story. 
and uh, he he um, he went to the church that that he was to to meet to go to and and um, he was hoping that at the end of the week of prayer he'd have some baptisms he was hoping that some people would come to Christ and maybe even people who had slipped away from Christ would come and 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 revive and and he would be able to uh, have some reconversions that's a good thing to, th to hope for isn't it well he was he was met by the pastor and the pastor was an old man he was well, I said he was old, but he's not that much older than me. So, you know, the older I get, the less old, old seems, I guess. But at any rate, uh, the, this pastor it was really old school, and he says, Now, listen, in this church, we don't get really excited. So, you know, just want you to know. Um, uh, and uh, we, don't, we don't usually say loud amens or... Uh, we don't have people crying or anything like that. And so, you know, just, just be aware this is the kind of church that we have here. And this pastor was thinking, well, that's interesting. Evangelist was thinking that. And he says, uh, also, I, I just, I, I, do, I, I have to tell you, I guess, you know, it'll probably come out sometime. So I guess I might as well just go ahead and tell you right out. He says, I didn't really want you to come. Uh, you know, the, I asked the, the kids who they wanted and, and, you know, they said your name and so I asked you to come, but, you know, I'm, I'm not real crazy about your style and, and so forth. And so, you know, I, well, he was thinking to himself, I'm not real crazy about yours either, but, you know, at any rate, they, <laughs> he was there and so he thought, well, I'll do the best I can. And, um, and so he, he, he began the week of prayer and sure enough, it was one of those kind of churches where, you know, you couldn't uh, get an amen. And uh, he couldn't, couldn't seem to be able to move anybody. And he would just preach and preach and wasn't seem to make any impression on anyone. And uh, so, so, you know, he, he started at Monday, Monday evening, and, and nobody seemed to be moved at all. He, he gave a call and nobody came forward, nobody raised their hand. And, you know, he was getting discouraged. And, you know, Tuesday and nobody came forward and, you know, gave a call. Finally, he got to Wednesday, and he says, you know, he had the same experience where nobody had, had, uh, had seemed like nobody would, would raise their hand or commit their heart to Christ or, you know, just seemed like everybody was listening to the sermon, but they weren't going anywhere with this. And he was thinking, this is not going to work. And so he decided, I'm going to fast and pray. And I'm going to fast and pray until something happens in this church. So he went, you know, Wednesday evening after the meeting, he went to his room and he began to pray. And he prayed all night. He prayed, you know, began praying 10 o'clock, 11, 12, 1, 2, on through. And finally, at about 6 o'clock in the morning, he says that the, the peace of God came on him and the, and the Lord spoke to him, not audibly, but the Lord told him that he was going to have success there, that he was going to see revival in that church before he left. And so he, he was able to have peace. And he thought, well, you know, this is wonderful. The Lord's given me the assurance that, you know, something is going to happen here. Well, he had, he was, he was preaching again that night. That was, that was the, the last night of the, uh, of the service of the, of the week of prayer. It was that Thursday evening. And so he decided he was going to tell the, the story. The best one that he had uh, was the story of the prodigal son. And so he, he told that story and he personalized it some. He called the the, the son that left, you know, the prodigal son, he called him Bill. And he said, and then the other boy, the one that stayed home, he called him John, you know, and so he would use their name as he would go through and just kind of describe that. And so he was talking along and he said, and there was a certain man, he had two sons, and, and the name of the one son was, the name of the one son, he, he decided he wanted the money that was due to him, and his name was, well, you know it, but he couldn't think of it. And he couldn't think of it, and he couldn't think of Bill. He just couldn't think of the word. He, and so he went on, and, and he said, well, and he, he asked his father if he would give him the, you know, the, the money that belonged to him. And his name was, and he couldn't think of Bill. He just couldn't think of it. And so finally, after, you know, he'd gone through this routine of, of saying, you know, and his name wasn't then not having a name and people were starting to smile and, you know, <laughs> and he was starting to get embarrassed and, and, and he, he was thinking, I can't think of this name. Why can't I think of the name? And so finally he just decided to call him John, you know, he says, by the time I get to, to the other one, maybe I'll think of the first one's name, you know, and so then he went along and he preached along and, you know, and he went off in a far country, John went off in a far country and then... 
And then he found that, you know, and, his, uh, and the man had another son, and his name was, and he couldn't think of any other name. And he's trying to think, oh, I've already used up John. I don't know what name to call him now. And so he couldn't think of the name. And, and so he went on and, you know, said a few more things. And they said, the name was, and he couldn't think of a name. And he was starting to think to himself, you know, a little bit about, <laughs> had this prayer service all night, and the Lord gave me this assurance that something's going to happen with this church, and everybody's laughing at me, and, you know, if this is what the Lord's going to have, maybe I should have slept last night, and then I have a memory, and I could remember how to, you know, somebody's name instead of being up here making a fool of myself and everything. And so he was, he was kind of getting a little bit uh, put out with himself, and finally he, he just said he didn't have a name and they called him Little Bud for short. <laughs> well, now, you know, Little Bud is not really shorter than John, but at any rate, um, for some reason, that he came out with that, and, and he said as he began to, you know, pick up the story again, he said there was a young man that uh, was about in the middle of the, of the congregation, and he, he came to the aisle, and he, he, began, he, he was making his way to the aisle, and he says, well, is he coming forward? But after this fiasco, I can't imagine that anybody would, would respond. And, you know, he hadn't even given the call yet. But he, he saw him, you know, making his way out. And, and, but then he got to the aisle and he went back to the back. And he thought, well, I guess he's leaving. <laughs> so I would leave too if I could. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was feeling pretty sorry for himself. But the young man went around and then he came back and he came up this side, came up the aisle, and then he came around to the front and the woman who was the choir director, he came over to her and he threw his arms around her neck. And when she saw him, she said, glory to God, praise the Lord, and started crying. And this evangelist says, you know, he didn't know what was going on. And he's thinking, boy, the pastor's going to kill these people. They're not supposed to be saying amen or anything, you know. And here they are shouting and, and, and crying and everything. And, and he didn't know what was happening. And then about that time, the, 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 uh, the, the head elder turned around and saw the, you know, this woman with the young man, and, and he said, praise the Lord. And he went over, and he started creating a ruckus, and here they were crying and, and arms around each other, and everything was going on. And, and, and pretty soon, the pastor himself, you know, the one that said, you know, we're a quiet church, and we don't say amens, and, you know, nobody uh, cries or anything around here. Pretty soon, he goes over, and he's, he's praising the Lord, and they're hugging each other, and the whole church starts, there's an uproar. And the choir comes down, and they're all hugging and crying, and, and the pastor didn't know, I mean, this evangelist didn't know what in the world's going on. He's thinking, I don't, I don't know, what, I don't know what's, what's happening here. And so he's thinking, well, maybe I should just slip out, you know, and let them have their <laughs> little meeting here that they're doing. And I mean, it's, it's just, it was so much noise and everything. He was starting to think, this isn't really scriptural. I think I need to go. And so he was starting, getting ready to slip out, and he felt a hand on his shoulder, and he turned around, and it was... Uh, the, the little woman who's the organist, about five foot tall, and she says, how did you know? Who told you? And he says, who told me what? Well, she says, who told you to preach on the prodigal son? Well, he said, I, I could tell you, but you probably wouldn't believe me. And, and, uh, and she said, well, no, the, that young man is the head elder's son, and he's been... A prodigal. He's been gone for over two years. He was out of the country. Nobody knew where he was. They thought he might have even been dead. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew that he could possibly be in the, in the country or in the state or even in this town or certainly in this church right now to hear you talking. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, praise the Lord. I'm, you know, he was starting to tear up himself. And he says, I need to go, you know. And she, she, she pulled him around again. She says, excuse me, she says, how did you know? And he says, how did I know what? She says, well, somebody must have told you. Told me what? Well, his name is John. And you've been calling it all evening. You had to have known. And he said, I didn't know any of this. And so he was saying, I got to go. And he was getting ready to slip out again. And she pulled him around again. And she said, he only he doesn't have any, any sisters. He only has one brother. And they call him Little Bud. <laughs> And he says, praise the Lord. <laughs> I really have some things to say to God now. <laughs> what a miracle. One person who is willing to take the time and 
who was willing to say to the Lord, I am going to pray and I'm going to fast until I have the assurance that something is going to happen in this church and something happened in the church. Do you think it can happen again? Do you think that God is still powerful enough to give the special knowledge that's necessary to you so that you can reach that one individual that needs help? that you only could help, that you were the one who will come into contact with that could be the means of their salvation. Do you think God can do that? Or do you think that's just you know, something that happened long ago and can only happen to someone else like John Wesley or to Martin Luther, but it can't happen to us? What do you think? Do you think that power is available to us today? Do you think we can be this kind of individual? Do you think we have this kind of power available to us? Well, the question is, are we going to be this kind of people? Are we going to do what is required? Are we going to have this kind of devotion and this kind of prayer life and this kind of earnestness about what we do? Are we going to be lackluster and run-of-the-mill and ordinary and average and ho-hum and see a lack of power in our church? That's the question. Will we be this kind of individual? Because this kind only comes out, only comes out, only by prayer and fasting. That's what's required. That's the price that we must pay. So let's be this kind of individual. That's what we need. Well, I suppose there are many other stories we could tell. Let me read this again. When churches are revived, it is become some, because some individual seeks earnestly for the blessing of God. He hungers and thirsts after God. He asks in faith and receives accordingly. He goes to work in earnest, feeling his great dependence upon the Lord, and souls are aroused to seek for a like blessing and a season of refreshing falls on all the hearts of men. The extensive work will not be neglected. The larger plans will be laid at the right time, but personal, individual effort and interest for your friends and neighbors will accomplish much more than can be estimated. It is for the want of this kind of labor that souls for whom Christ died are perishing. Let's stand and close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we want to be this kind of individual, the kind that you can depend on, the kind that can stand for the right though the heavens fall, the kind that can go through to the end, but we realize we cannot be those kind of people unless we are 100% yours, unless we have left every vestige of the world behind, unless we have accepted the cleansing that only you can give. And unless we have made our calling and election sure, it's the only way we can be this kind of individual. And tonight we want that for, for ourselves. We want to be this kind of person. And as we have come to the end of this seminar, may we be able to take the blessings that have been given and provided and that we have received through this week, and not just keep them for ourselves, but that we would share and, and, and use those blessings to help others who need help so badly, who need your word so badly. Give us that strength and blessing so that we can be this kind of person for you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.